The Reverend Martin Luther King said, of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. This evening, Class Act is honored to present our distinguished panelists in this forum on health disparities in America. I'm Marion Dry, co-chair with Jonathan Sprague of Class Act HR 73. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend and my classmate, Dr. Vivian Lewis, who is our moderator. She's a professor emerita of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. Dr. Lewis has served in several leadership roles in the medical school and the university focusing on promoting a more diverse and inclusive faculty and future healthcare workforce. She has numerous medical publications and has been a leader in the National Medical Association and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as an advisor for the National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. A certified leadership coach, Dr. Lewis focus, focuses her research on mentoring and professional development, especially for underrepresented minorities and women in the sciences. Welcome, Vivian. Thank you, Marion, and thank you all for showing up this evening. It's truly an honor to welcome you to this evening's forum. This pandemic has exposed an ugly truth about American society. When it comes to the opportunity to live healthy lives, we are not all equal. And that makes fighting this pandemic all the more challenging. Our task tonight will be to share information, have a dialogue, and seek solutions to this tragic injustice. As your moderator, I will start with a little background to frame the issues for the panel whom I will introduce shortly. I have some questions for each of them to get us started before opening it up to everyone. I also encourage you as Marion did to read the resource material and post any that you would like to add. So what are health disparities? As the term suggests, these are differences in medical outcomes. The Centers for Disease Control puts it this way. Health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve op optimal health. What we in the medical world call social determinants of health include socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, minority status, language, and housing and transport transportation. The pandemic has disproportionately affected low-wage earners, people living in crowded conditions, and multi-generational families, as well as people of color. For example, most recent CDC data show that COVID hospitalization rates are five to six times higher for Blacks and Latinx people. And notably, several states have been slow to collect data by race and ethnicity, making it harder to tease out and address the impact of racism and discrimination. Furthermore, some recommendations such as work from home and isolate symptomatic persons are virtually impossible for the most vulnerable among us. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a perfect illustration of the interrelatedness of these social determinants of health and medical outcomes, as well as how these issues are important for all of us. So what can we do about it? I want to stress that this is a complex set of issues and there will be many aspects that we'll be unable to get to tonight. But our panelists will help guide us to some straightforward actions that we should all be prepared to consider. With that, I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished panel, three renowned experts in medicine, public health, and government policy. Let's meet them. First up, Dr. Mary Travis Bassett. Can we see you, Dr. Bassett? Hi. Dr. Bassett has dedicated her entire career to advancing health equity. Dr. Bassett is the director of the Francois Xavier Banyu's Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University and the FXB Professor of Practice for Health and Human Rights 
at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Prior to joining the FXB Center, she was New York City's Commissioner of Health from 2014 to 2018. Welcome, Mary. Dr. Thanks Prentice for having me. Dr. Prentice Taylor, Jr. Could we see you, Dr. Taylor? You'll see him in a moment. Dr. Prentice Taylor is Vice President of Medical Affairs at Doctor on Demand, a leading innovative national telemedicine company. He is also an attending physician at Advocate Christ Hospital in Metro Chicago and the former medical director at Advocate Aurora Healthcare, the largest health system in the Midwest. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. She'll, she'll, there, there you are. are. Hello. <laughs> All right. And last but not least, Al Franken. Hello, Al. Al Franken of Saturday Night Live fame is also a best-selling author and award-winning radio show host. I should also mention he's a former U.S. Senator who was co-chair of the bipartisan Senate Rural Health Caucus, as well as a member of the Senate Health Committee during his eight and a half years representing Minnesota. In 2019, he began the Al Franken podcast, which focuses on the most important issues facing our country as we head into the 2020 election. Welcome, Al. So let's start with a few questions. I'm going to start with Mary. So Mary, as New York City's health commissioner, you oversaw many initiatives to address the sources of health inequities. Which initiatives do you think would be most helpful in the context of addressing this COVID-19 epidemic? Uh, thanks, Vivian, and, and thanks for letting me be an honorary member of the class of 73, where I had many friends in that class. So, uh, you, you know, you've asked a simple question that doesn't have a simple answer. Uh, public health really um, extends beyond the boundaries of technical interventions that address communicable disease control. Of course, communicable disease control is a core function of public health. And the first tool that public health always has uh, is data. Uh, you've mentioned the data already, which very early in this pandemic, within the first month of the first death uh, reported in the United States of COVID-19, we began seeing very large racial disparities in, uh, in both uh, infection rates and in mortality. Um, and so being able to identify these disparities is a key role of public health. And then we have tools uh, which are useful even when there is no uh, specific treatment, which we don't yet have for this virus, and there is no vaccine. And, and those include testing, uh, getting, uh, identifying people who are infected, uh, either isolating the infected, finding the people who they've been exposed to, quarantining those, standard stuff. Uh, but of course, in the United States, um, we've really made a mess of it. Um, and, and we continue to have an out of control um, pandemic in many settings, despite the success and in some cities like Boston, where I am now, or New York City, where I used to live. So those are technical tools, uh, but they run up against the ability of people to follow public health advice. And those are related to what you described as the social determinants of health. And this pandemic has really displayed the fissures in our society. Uh, there hasn't been a single year since the founding of this country. In fact, beginning even before this became a nation, um, when people of African descent haven't been sicker and died younger than whites. And we have seen that on real display. That's not because there's any inherent biological difference. It's because of the social dimensions of race and what it means about everyday life for people of color in this country. So the answers are to use your public health tools. That means investing in public health, which the United States is not doing. Uh, the investment in public health has declined uh, in recent years, both nationally and locally, uh, meaning that state health department budgets have gone down by uh, close to 20%, as have local health department budgets in the past 
decade. Uh, and astoundingly, uh, the United States, which already spent less than any other wealthy country on public health, uh, has seen its share of the GDP expended on public health decline. So that was not a good plan. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have to focus these tools on the populations where, where the disease is having the biggest impact. And these tools work. We, we have the capacity to implement them. But unless we acknowledge the fact that people can't follow our advice, if you live in the Navajo Nation and have no running water, uh, telling people to wash their hands frequently is not reasonable advice or if you have to work and you must continue to go to work in order to feed your family, and of course we have hunger on the rise in poor communities now, uh, then telling people to stay home and work is not possible. It's all the things that you mentioned in your introductory remarks mm -hmm. have, uh, have fed into the, what we're seeing now. Somebody just put in the chat an analysis that I and colleagues did at the uh, School of Public Health, which shows a very, uh, large disparities in the risk of dying of COVID by race, by age group, and particularly in younger, among younger people. And these are data that have just been made available. The federal government has been shockingly uh, irresponsible in not making uh, data publicly available rapidly. Uh, but the, um, the data show, for example, uh, the most stunning example is uh, blacks between the age of 35 and 44 are nine fold higher risk of death, have a nine fold higher risk of death uh, than their white counterparts in that age group, nine fold. So that's not due to comorbidities. The underlying, which are often referenced, the underlying diseases um, that we're talking about are very common among all Americans, and they carry an excess risk of no higher than twofold. But when you see a ninefold higher risk, something else is going on, and that's living in crowded housing, living in multi generational housing, continuing to work outside the home and getting there on crowded transport, and um, uh, so on. So I've sort of moved on to the second part of your question, I know. Yes. So. Thank you. I'm oh, and I, you wanted an answer. I what? did, and I got an answer. Yes. Okay. A good answer, too. Not a happy answer, but a good answer, a great answer. Thank you. I'm going to turn to you, Prentice. I'm going to ask you to please comment on the particular role of physician bias against people of color, especially poor people of color. How important is it, both in terms of direct patient care and healthcare systems, and what can we do about it? Well, thank you for asking that question. I, I should say at first, it's not my intention in what I'm about to say to upbraid or admonish individual uh, white doctors or of any color, but rather to um, focus on the system that got us to where we are today. So if I have a tinge of anger in what I'm going to say, it's because of those things. So one of the things that some of our colleagues who are not physicians may not understand, that when we refer to the practice of medicine in the United States, that is a double entendre, which has generally meant that uh, we bring in uh, young medical school graduates, often to urban, but sometimes even suburban settings, where uh, they get to work in the clinic on people from lower socioeconomic status. And uh, there are all sorts of comments that have been uh, explicit, not only implicit, about practicing on these individuals. Uh, I remember very clearly when I was a resident at the University of Chicago, after leaving Harvard Medical School, uh, that uh, there were comments by my colleagues of my own age, not to say, and also of, of older professors that, well, you know, we're here for research in the inner city, and that's what these people in the clinics are for. They're, these people are here for research. So in other words, what they were saying, that we tolerate these less educated ghetto blacks and Latinos uh, because we need to do research to enhance our careers. And uh, so that has been the practice for quite some time. 
And, it, and there has been progress. Very recently, I've been heartened to see that we don't routinely label people with racial terms. It used to be very common in all sorts of presentations on medical wards and grand rounds to say, well, this is a 41-year-old uh, black woman or a 61-year-old Caucasian man, when the race was often irrelevant in that, you know. The other thing that I would mention that there's been an ugly side to this. So when I was a resident, the acronym SPAS was used quite a bit by my colleagues. So for those who are not familiar with it, just to keep this dignified, please Google S-H-P-O-S. So SPAS is, is a derogatory term uh, for a, a patient who uh, is uh, from the inner city and poorer than you are and maybe ask questions that you didn't uh, contemplate them asking. So it is a way of putting people into a box. And, and you can see if you Google that, it's an ugly term which was commonly used for people who were being tolerated. So what I wanna just say is that all of this has led to some progress, but there has certainly been racism in training in medicine. I remember also being a young doctor and going to uh, a lecture by a very distinguished uh, gastrointestinal professor from uh, New York who was presenting some new, new research. And as all of us were filing out, I was uh, stunned to hear some of my colleagues of my own age joking and say, well, some folks say that darkies don't steal, but that's way down yonder in the cotton field. So in other words, they were impugning the integrity of this black man who had some very forefront research to say you couldn't trust that he was lying about what he had to say. So all I want to say is that this has been part and parcel of this. Let's go on to more positive comments coming up to the current date. So one of the other things that you wanted to ask me about is uh, what can we do about all of this? Yeah. The uh, Leonard Egede article, which is in the, the references from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, mentions a number of positive things that can be done to confront and to, in a positive way, uh, rebuild and, and redress. It, it mentions among um, many, many recommendations, there are about six of them, uh, community programs that can build stable and supportive structures that should be considered as part of pandemic recovery efforts. Uh, there are various health outcomes in, in terms of so, social determinants of health, uh, access to healthy foods. There are many programs now uh, doing produce prescriptions for people who are uh, seen in socioeconomic settings where they're in food deserts and helping them uh, get transportation to be able to eat healthier and follow some of the dietary guidelines and uh, have safer communities and being able to exercise out in parks safely, which is all part of the overall environmental concerns. Also, health systems need to make consistent efforts to build trust in terms of vulnerable communities. Uh, there's a lot of historical distrust that goes back to the Tuskegee experiments that for people who are not familiar, they may want to, uh, to Google Tuskegee study. Unethical experimentation, the Henrietta Lacks uh, research that led to the HeLa cells and cancer research, and many ways that uh, African Americans have made many contributions indirectly as well as directly uh, to further uh, outstanding medical treatment and research uh, in, in our society. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna leave it there, but I know we'll be coming back later with some other uh, constructive things we'll be recommending to wrap it all up. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. So in, in the space of about a minute, could you talk a little bit about telehealth and why that's both the solution and a possible barrier to addressing health disparities? Well, telehealth has been around for a long time, but it's become particularly useful during the pandemic when people couldn't get into their familiar local doctors or clinics, either because they didn't have the personal protective equipment or the staff didn't want to work for whatever reason. So there's a big adoption among patients as well as doctors in seeing people, particularly in video visits, but when those are not available, telephone visits that functions just like, like I'm in my telemedicine studio right now, and this is how it looks when you're talking to the doctor, except I'd have a white coat on. 
But um, more seriously, in terms of limitations, we have to also understand that broadband access is, is a problem in many parts of our country. In the company that I work for, uh, we are in all 50 states. We have a lot of people calling in from small towns, ranches, as well as inner cities, suburbs, all sorts of environments. But what those people have in common is they have decent broadband access so that they can talk back and forth synchronously with a doctor uh, or other health professional. And that's something that is lacking in many areas. Another problem we have just very briefly in terms of socioeconomics is some people who do have smartphones that could support video uh, can only afford a plan where they have to really, really watch their minutes. And so their minutes on their, their phone plan may be limiting in terms of what they can afford. And we need to find ways as a society to uh, make this uh, dimension, internet access, uh, basically a human right. Thank you. Al, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about um, making some comment about your experience in the Senate. You were chair of the Rural Health Care Caucus, as well as a member of the um, Health Committee. To what extent do you think the impact of COVID on rural populations could have been predicted? The density of cities has been, uh, that, that's where we've seen the most. We, we, there, there are pockets in rural America, particularly, and Mary mentioned the Navajo in the Southwest, uh, and we have 11 tribes in Minnesota. Um, and I check in with the tribes, uh, and they're doing fairly well relative to uh, elsewhere uh, in the country. But it, yeah, the Navajo have just, it's just hit them so hard. Uh, so there are pockets, meat, meat packing plants, et cetera. Um, what, what we know is, is that they don't have the equipment in many of the rural areas, so that, you know, and, or, and just rural health writ large uh, don't have the specialists. Uh, you three are doctors, uh, Mary and, and uh, uh, Prentice and, and you. I'm not a doctor, but I played one in a sketch. And um, so in, in rural America, you have much, many fewer specialists, uh, so they don't have access uh, to that. I want to say one thing about Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion is so popular in rural Minnesota and rural America. The last four states to adopt Medicaid expansion by referendum are Idaho, Nebraska, Utah, and Oklahoma. And there is a reason for that which is that Medicaid expansion, uh, what, what's happened is the hospitals in rural America now don't have where they have Medicaid expansion, no longer have all this uncompensated care when people go into the emergency room and they have no coverage. So the hospital has to eat it. And now mm -hmm. that all of these people are on Medicaid, that the hospital gets paid. So because of that, they've had a lot more money to expand their scope of practice, to hire more doctors, more nurses, more technicians, get better machinery. They've done, the food is better at the hospitals. I went, I did a lot of round tables uh, when the Republican plan was out and people were freaked out because they were gonna cut Medicaid expansion. I was at one uh, town meeting in a, in a small community at a hospital, and uh, they told me that the hospital cafeteria had now become the destination for dining out. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they would, you go to a movie, you go to the cafeteria, get, you know, they got the lasagna and the salad bar there. And then we go to, Marjean really likes Tarantino. So we go out and it, it, it so this, uh, what we really, the best thing we can do 
is uh, if everyone wants to know what to do here is vote <laughs> and uh, get, uh, capture the Senate and the White House so that we can uh, do the things that we need to do. And, but, you know, in, in rural America, it would be nice, uh, for example, to really do a lot of loan forgiveness for doctors who uh, serve in rural areas. Also, a big deal, a big aspect of this is to uh, promote, promote the idea of people from rural America going to medical, medical school, create a path for them. Because a lot of people like to live where they grew up and then be near their family. And so we need, so, yeah, I, I, okay. <laughs> Do you want me to continue yeah, sure. on or what? Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. So um, I want to have time to get some questions to everyone. Uh, but in about one minute, could you please uh, summarize some of the best thinking that you've heard? from your guests on um, your podcast, your Al Franken podcast, about how we can address the root causes of health disparities. So well, again, I've had uh, one of the people I've had on frequently is Andy Slavitt, who is head of uh, Medicare and Medicaid on the last two years in Obama. And of course, uh, you know, we're talking about the same thing, which is, getting to universal health care. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean single payer. I was, I actually, during the debates, was a little taken aback by spending 20 minutes every time on single payer because I, I, I'm not against single payer, but um, single payer without any private insurance, no other country has that. Mm -hmm. Oh, every other developed country. Bernie would keep saying, "Would keep saying, every other developed country has universal health care. They do it for half the cost and have does good outcomes." Yeah, and they all have private insurance. <laughs> and uh, what I was very worried about uh, was we picked up forty-one seats. In uh, in eighteen, and it was all it was healthcare. It was about healthcare, and those were we picked up those seats because they flipped from Republican to Democrat. So by nature, those are, are purple districts at best. And the reason that uh, people don't want to lose their health insurance, and the worst thing that Obama said was, or the biggest mistake was saying, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. And that wasn't true. And that freaked people out. And the reason it wasn't true is that insurance companies were free to every year to change their insurance, you know. And we didn't write that into the law because we probably couldn't have when we were doing uh, uh, Obamacare, doing, doing the ACA. Uh, but the, the best thing we can do, the best advice that I've gotten is to win this election. But uh, obviously, as Mary said, uh, in terms of uh, addressing COVID, uh, we, we have to be test. This is crazy what's happened. This is, you know, I don't mind having a malignant narcissist as the president. We could, if we had had a different malignant narcissist who was smart enough to know that it was in his interest to address this, I would have been fine with that. I don't need the empathy. I need some intelligence. And this is, this is what, this is American carnage. That's, this is the American carnage that he talked about in his, in his inauguration. And this guy is, you, you know, we have, we were going to have a pandemic. We weren't necessarily going to have an out of control pandemic. Mm -hmm. And if you look around the world, other countries have done it right. They've done exactly what Mary was talking about, yeah. and exactly yeah. what Andy Slavitt talks about. And that is testing, contact tracing, isolation, wearing masks, 
social distancing. That's what we should have been doing from the beginning. And then, and by the way, our economy would be opening now like yeah. it is in countries like Germany and other countries. That, I made maybe too much of a political statement because I know that most of our class is Republican. <laughs> That's a great, great segue, Al. Thank you. I'd like to have a, a few minutes to um, hear from a couple of the other panelists just about, for example, before we get to the call to action, how do we depoliticize some of these common sense things that we know work, that work in other countries? Who would think that wearing a mask would be making a political statement. So Mary and Prentice, do you have any uh, thoughts on those matters? I do, but they do sort of hint on politics. Um, we have a, a big problem with a disdain for expertise. And that's, you know, a, a political statement. Uh, but that's what we need right now. Uh, a sensible response would have reports by our public health agency, which is the Centers for Disease Control, talking to the public every day. Uh, public health authorities are generally trusted authorities. They're not viewed as ones that have political agenda. Uh, but uh, what's happened instead is that this has been politicized right down to the ground. And a lot of it caught up in a really dangerous game of trying to avoid blame so that you have you know, the central authority saying, ah, it's the state's responsibility and uh, setting up governors for blame, governors setting up mayors for blame. You know, this is just um, has, you know, and so I, I, I think that we have to do some serious thinking about um, how it is that we've come to have so much disdain for the idea of scientific expertise. Although Tony Fauci is well regarded. Yes, yes, he's you, you know, come out unscathed. Prentice. Just speaking yeah, no, for me, I, I would say that my viewpoint on this is that uh, this is where racism again comes into it. In the Midwest where I am, you have the divide between Southern Illinois and Metro Chicago, and the attitude has been downstate in Illinois. Well, uh, that's an urban problem. It doesn't involve us. Same thing nearby in Michigan, where they look at Detroit and the people, the, you know, who are good people, but uh, they, there's been the same thing. So I think racism yeah. has tinged no, some right. of this response. Uh, but, uh, you know, some of the uh, rebellion against science and the politicization, I mean, it, it didn't work out too well for Herman Cain these last three weeks. So and I don't mean that as a joke. It's interesting to see as, as this shifts to rural areas, which is happening whether the uh, code that we're hearing, which is as, as, um, as Prentice, I hope I can call you Prentice, is, yes, as, is saying is that urban areas mean the black and brown people. Um, but now we're, we're, you know, we're gonna see that, that, that the cities were the front door. Uh, they yes. were not uh, the, uh, the, the, the last stop. Well, Sorry, I believe Alan. in California, it's already hitting the rural areas, the mm -hmm. Central Valley farming communities. Um, I think that they're largely contributing to this latest wave. Mary brought up sort of uh, Trump punting it to the states. And I was in the Senate when we were doing Ebola. And we led a global effort yeah. to tamp down Ebola. Part of it was because the CDC was in Africa and identified it in Liberia and then went into Liberia. We, we treated people. We had the military came and uh, built hospitals and we were led a global effort. Mm -hmm. Trump, ha in instead of, you know, we, we used to be the indispensable country, the indispensable nation. And instead of, this is a global problem. And instead of having, being part of a global solution, and let alone leading a global solution, he punted it down to the states. I mean, it's, it, it's as if after Pearl Harbor, 
FDR said, well, this is mainly, you know, Hawaii's problem. Not funny, but yes, that, that is sad. I want to give each of you a chance to share your calls to action for the class. And then I, I do want to hear from, uh, not the class, the audience, really. It's our class, but it's also the audience, which is much broader. And then I, I want to open it up to um, some of our audience to be able to contribute their questions. So, uh, Mary, what's your... Oh, I thought you might reverse order. Well, I, I have to a uh, echo um, Al and say that central to this is, uh, is making sure that everybody registers and votes. We, we really uh, had uh, this, um, the, the fissures that we have been discussing uh, actually do extend beyond one administration. Uh, the legacy of a racial hierarchy in the United States, as I said, extends back centuries. Uh, and the stripping of workers' rights, the lack of paid sick leave, and uh, the lack of any leave for many precarious workers. But all of these things can be addressed politically. And now we're seeing the terrible vulnerabilities that 40 years of, uh, of um, you know, income inequality escalating in this country has cost us. And the answer for that is to make sure that you're registered and you vote and you make sure everybody that you talk to knows that they have to do the same. Thank you. And if you live in a state that doesn't have Medicaid, um, you know, push for expansion. Great. Prentice. Uh, those are great points. Um, the three that I would put forward are that if you're a clinician listening to this, please take extra time practicing empathetic listening to patients of color so that you can build trust. And that will do a lot right there. For all people listening, I think you can mentor a young person of color from a disadvantaged background to fill your shoes, whether you're a physician or in another area, and that will help build trust as well as uh, additional structure in our society. And the third thing would be to donate to worthy, well-vetted organizations that are making a difference. I'd like to put in a plug for one called the National Medical Fellowships, uh, where I volunteer, I get nothing out of it, but I think they're an outstanding organization that provides uh, scholarships to uh, disadvantaged students of color to go to medical school. And that can build capacity. So those would be my recommendations. Great. How about you, Al? What's your call to action? Oh, I have a specific one in terms of uh, the election, which is, and I know, uh, our class members are, are in the area of 69 years old. And so we're probably not the best candidates for this. But uh, on, on the show, I've had Mark Elias, who is the chief uh, election lawyer for Democrats. And that he's really busy this year uh, in court, and et cetera. But the thing he emphasized the most, the most, was for people to train to be uh, poll workers. And, and, and I'm talking about asking your, you know, instructing your kids to do this. Yes, yes. But, uh, <laughs> most poll workers are above 60, a very high percentage. Mm -hmm. And a large percentage are above 70. And obviously, and this Supreme Court, on every damn decision, is making it harder for people uh, to adjust to COVID. They just had another one today. And they, it's like nine decisions. You know, the best known one was in Wisconsin when yeah. uh, they would not allow, they would not force Wisconsin to count absentee ballots or vote by mail that weren't in by election day as opposed to postmark. And, and this yeah. is a problem also, again, in like Indian country, it's really yeah. takes a long time to get a vote by, uh, the, the postal service just takes a, a long, long time. Yeah. But if you can get 
And and Biden was actually on uh, Joy Reid's show on MSNBC the first night that it was her show, so he was the, one of the special guests. In his segment with her, and I think he did two segments, he, he also said this, that we need people to train as poll workers because that means they'll be, you know, I'll give you an example of, about Milwaukee during the uh, Wisconsin primary. Milwaukee usually has over 100 uh, polling places. On, on that, uh, during that primary, they had five. Mm. And they had five because they couldn't get poll work because everybody who was older it was afraid, and right, rightly so. Um, so uh, we, uh, it, it, it is vote, but, but specifically get your, your kids and, you know, great nephews and whoever is <laughs> old enough to do it to, uh, you know, to, to train, get trained. Yes. That's great, and it certainly fits with uh, one of the Class Act priorities for the year. So we have some wonderful questions from our audience. I'd like to take a few of those. Uh, here's one. What will it look like to have COVID under control, with quotes? Just as after 9-11 there was a new normal, what can we expect a post-pandemic America to look like? Well, uh, well, one thing I am very concerned about is uh, the unemployment, of course, the people who've lost their jobs. Yeah. A lot of those jobs aren't going to come back. And uh, I am concerned about the future of work. And um, we have to do a lot of thinking about how to sustain people. Uh, we're in a horrible, horrible recession. That's the danger of being a depression. And even once we get our hands around this, and we should be able to do it by doing the very things that, that Mary and I were talking about. I mean, it's, it's, it's not brain science. It's just that uh, this guy, Trump, cannot admit that he made a mistake. Uh, so he won't, he doesn't, he hasn't adjusted at all. And he's invested in, in all the wrong things here. Uh, what I worry about is, is that post COVID and, and look, this, this has uh, really laid bare so many of our problems in this country. One of which is these disparities in healthcare, but also economic disparities, which is one of the root causes of disparities in, in health and in healthcare, obviously. And, um, you know, Biden, you know, when, when your opponent is digging himself a hole, you're supposed to, you let him dig. And, uh, you know, Trump has been digging himself a hole, but Biden's got to come out and talk about what he wants to do. And the good news about that is what he wants to do is what the American people want. They want to build on the Affordable Care Act. They want to address economic, the, the, this, this horrible income and wealth disparities. I was talking to Chris Rock, the other day and he said to me we were talking about wealth disparities and the spotlight people uh at the boston globe the ones who revealed the uh, priest pedophilia did a thing on the net worth of people in the boston area by race the average net worth of white family in boston $247,000. The average net worth of a black family in, in the Boston area, $8. Uh, 
Yeah. And it's going to be negative after COVID. It's going to be negative. And that was redlining. Yeah. That was homeownership. Exactly. It was redlining right after World War II. You had the GI Bill. Our soldiers came back. That's exactly there. Exactly. They came back. You could buy a home. That's where you start building your wealth. They were redlined and banks would not loan to people in, uh, to uh, African Americans in red line in, 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 in those areas. And that's how you build your wealth. That's right. Stunning. You hit on the nose. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary. No, I just think that I, I just want to echo um, that, you know, that, uh, we start out with all these numbers. Uh, the United States is reporting nearly a quarter of the global disease number of global deaths from COVID-19. Now, these may or may not be complete even for the United States, but we're under 5% of the global population. So this really should make us all very worried. And it hasn't totally been incompetent, although that's been part of it. It's also the underlying vulnerabilities that we have by having a society that is divided um, so um, determinedly by race, not just in urban areas, but in suburban areas and rural areas. Somebody put up the New York Times piece um, and uh, that, you know, that showed that. And one in which income inequality has simply escalated to phenomenal yeah. levels where three people whose names we all know control the amount of wealth that uh, uh, that is accounted for by uh, about half of the population of the world. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, this is not a stable situation. Right. And we're seeing how, how it's cost us. So we, we, there's a chance for change, I hope. Mm -hmm. I hope for ourselves and for our children. I hope so too. Yeah, let me briefly add, uh, Vivian, from a health perspective, I hear a lot of discussions from various folks about how people are, uh, first of all, staying home and not going into the emergency room when they need care for things like uh, what may be strokes or maybe heart attacks, but also it's having a ripple effect on preventive care and getting vaccinations. So we may see uh, an uptick in the number of measles cases across the country of kids who are not getting vaccinated. I was just listening to George Benjamin, the uh, head of the American Public Health Association, just yesterday on this very point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. So another question from our um, audience. Um, are there successful models for bringing community health care to underserved communities? Um, let me just briefly comment. I think Mary can go into this in more depth that there's a wonderful system of federally qualified health centers out there in the country. And one of the things that was for me uh, a, a double loss with the last presidential election is that Hillary Clinton explicitly said that she wanted to increase funding for federally qualified health centers who, who generally serve um, communities of lower socioeconomic status. And they certainly don't appear to have flourished under the current administration. So uh, my sense is there's gonna be a need to uh, look at how we can bolster the FQHCs and models like that. And there are many other, mo many other models. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the important um, aspects of really high quality community care is that it reaches outside of the clinic doors and views its responsibility to a geographic area, to a population, and views it, the population as its patient, not just the individuals who walk through its doors. And there are many examples, both in the United States, uh, beginning with the prototypes of the FQHCs and began in the Mississippi Delta uh, and in a part of Boston. Uh, which I've forgotten which part of Boston it was. Um, but, and, and many, many fine examples. It, it's, it's, very, it's very doable, uh, but it requires a, a system that isn't simply looking for high cost procedures that carry a, a, a broad profit margin. We, right. we have to reimburse on the basis of health 
and not just on the basis of uh, costly procedures. Yeah. I, I if think, people want to find a great example, just look at City Block Health. That's one that actually uh, has had roots in Boston and New England that uh, is doing phenomenal work in, in this regard, City Block Health. Again, um, expanding Medicaid mm. would do a tremendous amount. Uh, Atul Gawande has written a lot about this, and we know that people, what healthcare is about regularly seeing a doctor, uh, you know, getting regular checkups. It's not about, healthcare is not about, you know, emergency surgery. That's not what people's healthcare is about. And what has really helped was the ex expansion of Medicaid. And so that people could, and, and making sure that people could get free uh, checkups and free preventive health. And we need to just keep doubling down on preventive stuff. And we have to start doing health care and not sick care. And yeah. we have to incentivize keeping people healthy. And so there are a whole bunch of different models where group, you know, healthcare providers, groups of healthcare providers get paid to um, a certain amount to cover a whole bunch of people. And uh, if they keep them healthy, they do better. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of models that work and that we need to do. You keep doing it. And uh, Trump is, you know. I have to say, Al, you may not be a doctor, but you are a public health person. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, thank you. Well. I will give you some cred for that. I, did, I didn't even play a public health person. On uh, TV. On <laughs> I think that Anthony Fauci role might be open. But um, here's a, a sort of very related question because one of the um, audience uh, um, people mentioned that Medicare doesn't allow for a lot of the social support interventions that yeah. we've talked about that are so important in addressing health disparities. Would Medicare, what would Medicare for all do about this problem and wouldn't Medicaid for all be better? So, I, don't, I, I'm not, I haven't practiced clinically in the United States for a long time, and I'm a single-payer supporter, a career-long single-payer supporter, because I don't see any uh, way to make a, a solvent system without having everybody in and uh, nobody out. So I think I should let some of my fellow panelists um, um, talk about how to fix Medicare, which is a universal entitlement. That's a, that's a real advantage. I know they don't cover mental, dental, apparently don't cover support services. You know, I would say briefly having uh, worked for a couple of the health insurance companies that Medicare Advantage health plans have a lot of good things about them. I don't think that's a total solution though, but uh, it, it, it is one option that can uh, uh, you know, more innovatively uh, look at um, how to get more value out of Medicare than the fee-for-service Medicare system that we're familiar with. Uh, Medicaid is so different from one state to another, depending on what the state legislator later wants to do with it. It's very progressive in some places like Massachusetts and very backward in places like Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm when, when I got to the Senate, uh, I had campaigned uh, for uh, Bernie Sanders when he, was, uh, when he was in Congress, uh, when he was in the House. I had done a huge fundraiser for him in Burlington where I did a show. When I first got to the Senate, the first day I got there, I went up to Bernie and I said, I'm, you know, if you need me, I'm for single payer. Um, but we're 58 votes short. So I <laughs> said, we got the ACA, and I still believe 
that we can build on that. And if you do Medicaid expansion, then people essentially, and not just Medicaid expansion, if you do, uh, if people can opt in to Medicaid mm -hmm. uh, and it works, or you Medicaid, Medicare, then uh, if, if it works better for people, then everyone will do it. And as I say, every other country, every other developed country has a, a, a mixed system. Even, even Great Britain, you can get, uh, which is socialized medicine, you can get insurance, uh, supplemental insurance. And every co other country has different models. So I'm, yeah, the, the, uh, we, Joe Lieberman prevented us uh, from the public option. And uh, we, need, we had 60 votes. And so you needed every one of us to agree to things. And we wanted the public option. And Joe nixed it. And that's a shame. But I think that's the first thing we need to do is is have a public option so people can get into that and then uh, if they discover that they're getting that they prefer that to their private insurance then people will will gravitate toward it and then that's what we'll do 70 percent of canadians get some kind of supplemental uh private insurance so I just, I'm, I'm, again, I'm for single payer, but also there are a lot of countries in the world that have developed countries that have single payer, but also have access to private insurance as well. Okay. So that we could spend the whole night talking about insurance. That is a fantastic uh, topic. And Talk so about pharmaceutical costs. I'm sorry. It, I'm sorry to interrupt. Not at all. So I didn't mean to interrupt you. Last question, because technically we're out of time, but we've been allowed a little bit more time, so I'm going to get in one more question. And that is, what about the impact of this pandemic on immigrant communities? That is one community that we really haven't touched on very much. So would anyone like to chime in on this one? I, I did hear, uh, you know, we talk about uh, disparity, uh, the effect of this on people of color. Latinx um, are, are dying at a higher rate than African Americans. And, um, you know, it depends what you call, you know, what. It, it, People, uh, people of Latino heritage are are dying, and many of them are obviously are immigrants. Sure. And, yeah. and um, you know, a, a lot of this, and we didn't mention it, is I don't think we did, is that so many of the people who have gone to work, gone back to work, are essential, uh, mm -hmm. essential workers. Uh, they are exposed. Yeah. Yeah. They're exposed to COVID. So if you're, and and they get paid almost nothing. So you're talking about you go to the supermarket, the people working in the supermarket or on our behalf, they're getting sick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, part, that's part of the statistics of that is, is that people who absolutely financially have to go back to work expose themselves to the risk. Yes, and then also everybody gets sick. So I mean, really, not I. I care on a humanitarian basis, but if you just wanted to be very, you know, cut and dried about it, it's terrible for the whole country. Um, well, again, that's what we go back to what Mary said we we really should be doing. And I, you know, that is, that's, uh, look, this guy, uh, Trump, 
for two months he denied that this was a, a problem. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Prentice and Mary, could you talk about a little bit about from a medical standpoint what what we can do to help immigrant com communities? Well, uh, the, I mean, a, a lot of it is the is the Latinx population, and I've been looking at the data, and the rates are going up, the mortality rates are going up, and um, and uh, we're 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 seeing the precarity of what it means to be an immigrant, and particularly if you're an undocumented immigrant, uh, you the jobs you have to take, the, the housing you have to live in, uh, and you know the how you how you get to work are all settings in which you're exposed. And additionally, though, we know that the rates of uninsurance are highest in the Latinx population. Uh, probably related to the fact that when you're undocumented, you have hardly any entitlement to anything but emergency care. And that is, you know, been extraordinarily short-sighted um, for all the reasons that, uh, that we've been talking about for the past hour. Uh, so, and in uh, Boston, uh, the hot spots outside of the nursing homes, which have been a key hot spot, uh, have been the Latinx communities, Chelsea, very hard hit. Uh, this is a working class Latino community. And um, uh, it has all to do with um, ha not having, you know, I'm just repeating myself, but in addition, uh, not having access to medical care, not having access to testing. People are afraid to go. You know, you're told you won't be charged if you have COVID. Well, what does that mean? You know, what happens if it turns out that you have, you know, something else? Are you going to pay for that? As long as it's unclear, as it is for most of us when we go to the doctor, what it's going to cost us when we are finished with that visit. Um, people who don't have money are not going to go until it's really late. And then the risk of dying is higher. So on that cheerful note. I know. <laughs> Just any, any final thoughts on that question? Um, Just that, uh, you know, it all comes back to we can't have a laissez-faire system of health care. And yeah. we also can't have leadership that wants to blame the victims. So hopefully we'll have a change in all of that. Yeah, that sums it up. I really want to thank the panel. You've been fabulous, as well as our uh, participants. I know that uh, Marion Dry has some uh, final words for us, but um, I've really appreciated the, your time and learning about your uh, thoughts and expertise on these important questions for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian, Mary, Prentice, and Al. That was fantastic. For each of these Class Act forums, we have our own calls to action, and these will be familiar to you not only because you have heard them from our panelists, but also because you heard them last month. This is an important moment. So make sure you are registered to vote and exercise your constitutional right to do so. Help others in any way that you can to register and exercise their constitutional right to vote. And if you haven't, or if you know someone who hasn't, please fill out the census. Again, thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Prentice. Thank you all. That was amazing. We have learned so much from you. Our thanks also go to Drs. Ron Diekman, David Fisher, Vivian Lewis, and Deborah Wynn, as well as Jonathan Spray, for their work conceiving of and creating this program. And to Andrea Kirsch, Rick Brotman, Sarah Greenberg, Sarah Ulrich, Diana Labanchu, and Katie Marinello for their production work. Finally, in keeping with the calls to action for this evening, I share the words of the late inspirational leader, Congressman John Robert Lewis, whose life and work were celebrated by our nation today at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. He said, my dear friends, your vote is precious, almost sacred. 
It is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>